You are listening to the Indie Rundown Podcast. Here are your hosts, Mike and Zach. All right. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. Whenever you're listening to this, this is the Indie Rundown Podcast. I'm Michael Tula with my co-host, Zach Salazar. And we have an awesome guest. If you are uh, an independent filmmaker at any level, and if you search YouTube for any sort of tips, Lord knows I have. <laughs> we all have. For everything, you've come across Indie Film Hustle, and uh, we are uh, thrilled to have the founder of the channel and of the brand. It is a brand now, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> Alex Ferrari. Thank you so much for having me, guys. I appreciate <laughs> of it. Of course, man. <laughs> yes, and uh, one of the, I, I remember when I moved from Houston, New York, uh, I was thinking to myself, man, you know, I wish I'd done this sooner. And I was mm -hmm. like, I know who else said that before is uh, – was you alex and mm -hmm. uh, it really kind of changes when you you know uh, we're talking about tarantino before this but it was like when you move to the place where people are doing what you want to do for a living it a it kind of makes you like not want to shy away from your passions as much because it's mm -hmm. not like <laughs> you know in the regional market it's like oh okay you're you're an indie filmmaker but anywhere else it's like oh wait a minute let's see let's see what can happen here but uh, right. it's more it's more tangible there you see it in front of your face you see it every day here man like it's it's i mean we could talk a little bit about how things have changed but generally speaking i think in any field you go to where the action is you want to be a broadway you want to be you'll be a stage actor you go to new york you know you don't come to la for that yeah mm -hmm. you know there's there's certain areas in the world that you know if you want to do something then you got to go there because that's where the action's at and i i mean i was from miami and i came out to la and man i mean it was like being thrown it's like walking on the sidewalk and being thrown into a you know a, you know a, um, a formula one race it's just a completely different pace it's it's the equivalent of high school football versus uh nfl like it's <laughs> like we all we all can like we all can grab a camera we all could shoot maybe we can maybe tell a story and you could do that in high school and you could also do that in the, in the mm -hmm. nfl and it's that kind of difference it's uh, it's pretty amazing and because of that you're um your muscles get stronger, your skills get sharper because you're working at such a high level with, uh, with great people around you and, and bad people around you too, which also sharpens you up a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. And uh, definitely wanted to touch up on that. You have a very interesting story. Uh, uh, if anyone's seen your keynote sp uh, speech at the <laughs> Brave Filmmaker or the Brave Maker Film Festival, yeah. um, was pretty remarkable. But um, Definitely want to uh, uh, listen uh, right now. If you check out IndieFilmHustle.com, uh, there's a lot of material out there for people, uh, courses, blogs, podcasts, there's education, you're writing books. Um, talk to me a little bit about your, just the evolution of not, not only you yourself as a filmmaker, but you know, as, your, the, as your brand, Indie Film Hustle, how that's evolved over the years. Well, I mean, I launched Indie Film Hustle in 2015. So a lot of people think I've been around for decades, but I've only been around for a little bit over five years. And I, I launched it as an online business. Uh, you know, I, I started doing a lot of research about creating an online business. And I was in a uh, bad business at the time. I was selling olive oil and vinegar, which I'm, uh, it's, it's a whole other conversation <laughs> for a whole other podcast. If you need to know what a good bottle of olive oil or vinegar is, I can explain that to you and your audience <laughs> later. But um, and there is, there is very, there's very specifics. Uh, but I was, I, was, uh, I was trapped in that bad scenario that I had placed my, myself in. And I started looking for other options. And uh, I, I read a book called The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. And that was the first time kind of the first time, or at least it re reawakened the goal to uh, be, uh, to create an online business. And I, I searched, I, I researched for about eight or nine months, uh, reading every book, taking courses, just educating myself about everything uh, to do with online businesses. And then of course, I'm um, the, uh, the idiot that I am. I'm like my wife, I have to tell my wife, I'm like, yeah, I'm looking for a niche. I don't know what to do. I, you know, I think, you know, maybe jelly beans. She's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> jelly beans. I'm like, yeah, I want to be like the dude that like, if you want to know about jelly beans, you come to me. She's like, you don't even like jelly beans. What's wrong with you? Do something about film. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll do something. And of course she was right. Um, so I looked into the space of, uh, because I was, I, in 2005, I was kind of entered the space originally, which I was, I, I think I have the first filmmaking tutorials on YouTube. I think, if not one of the first, uh, it was in 04. I think I, I uploaded it in 04, 05. And, um, what was the video about? 
my short film Broken. The, 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 mm-hmm. I did a short film called Broken, and it was just uh, you know educational tutorials on how to do visual effects and and breakdowns of uh, you know what we did with that movie, and that was my first entry point into educating filmmakers because I just honestly wanted to help filmmakers. I didn't see anything in the marketplace that could do something to really help filmmakers. Into and I know a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, in two thousand five there was no information for independent filmmakers online. Like there was just nothing that you had Robert Rodriguez's 10 minute film schools. And that was it. And I, and all my love to Robert, but you're rolling at 10 million bones, brother. I'm not, you know, <laughs> that's great that you show me how to make the guacamole gun. That's fantastic. But, uh, I needed something to, like, you know, I wanted to use final cut pro. I wanted to use a DVX 100, a mini DV camera, I, like used off the shelf stuff. And I needed it. I wanted to educate people and it, and it, it blew up. We sold over 5,000 DVDs easily wow. made over a hundred wow. grand, uh, off of a short film. So that was my first entry point into educating filmmakers. And then my ego got involved and I said, well, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not a teacher. I'm a filmmaker. And I, and I left, if I would have kept going, could you imagine? Yeah, what I, could have I would have owned the, the, the yeah. filmmaking tutorial space. But I, my ego got involved. I'm like, well, Spielberg didn't have to do tutorials. Why should I have to do that? Because that was the ego speaking. So then 10 years later, I jumped back into this and I look at the, mar- I look at the marketplace or I look at the, the, the niche and I didn't see anybody really speaking from a place of experience and nobody was really telling the truth. A lot of people were skirting the truth. A lot of people were like, oh, well, you know, you got to do this and do that. I'm like, that doesn't work, guys. I've been, I mean, I've been at that point, I was in the business 20 years. So I was like, I have a lot more experience. I have a lot more street credibility. I have a real IMDb page with real credits. Uh, and I've just been doing this for a long time. And I have a lot of shrapnel, a lot of shrapnel that I've picked up over the years. Um, uh, that you kind of hinted at it with my uh, keynote that I did about yeah. uh, my, <laughs> my my time uh, almost making a twenty million dollar movie for the mafia, uh, uh, which of course I wrote a book about called Shooting for the Mob, yeah. um, which we could talk about later. But uh, so I, I I decided to throw my hat in the ring and I created Indie Film Hustle uh, out of an I I, I kind of wanted it as a necessity for filmmakers to have a, a, a resource a real true raw resource about filmmaking about the business about what the realities of the business are you know warts and all because i mean i was in post-production for 20 odd years and i saw filmmakers come through my doors i was doing post I, I've, I've delivered probably over 50 features in my career and i sat there with these producers and directors and i would just hear the stories of past distribution issues or not being able to find money or these horror stories of things happening in addition to my own experiences, so I had this wealth of information and experience that I wanted to share with uh, the filmmaking community. And then what are, I some, just of, what are some of those uh, stories? I don't mean to cut you off, but like, like, like real quick. I mean, I mean, come on, everybody. I mean, like, there's so many, but like, oh, I don't know, a distributor. How many times have you heard the term? Oh, the distributor screwed me. Right. Like, you know, oh, I, right, I didn't make right. any money on that movie because of this guy or that guy. Oh, the money was supposed to drop from this investor, which got shady. And then the, the tax credit, like there's so many ways to get screwed in this industry. It is remarkable. It is remarkable that anything ever gets done. So I wanted to kind of put a, a beacon of hope out there for independent filmmakers <laughs> around the world of like, guys, this is what the reality is. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's it's brutal. It is rough and you're going to get your heart stomped on daily. But if you're going to go into battle, at least know what the rules are and need at least be prepared to take those hits because I see so many kids. I see so many people walking into this business just like, la, 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 I'm going to boom. And they just get completely (laughs) right hooked and that's it. And they're out. And I see that a lot here in Houston. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. And, and, and I wanted um, I wanted to create a resource to do that. So slowly but surely, I launched the new film hustle. And then I launched the podcast uh, right afterwards, about a month afterwards. And then within a few months, I was the number one filmmaking podcast on iTunes because I am a relentless marketer. Mm-hmm. Like I, I am a nonstop marketer. That's why you, what you said earlier, like you can't go online and type type an indie film and not see my name pop up. Like if you go into Google, generally speaking, just type in indie film, they will continue it with hustle. Um, (laughs) They will, they will complete the search for you. And that's taken years to do. I mean, it's just constant, a barrage of content that I create because I want to 
give as much inf- give as much information as possible. And then I branched out to Bulletproof Screenwriting, which is another company, um, uh, Filmtrepreneur, which is more entrepreneurial filmmaking based, and um, and then my other companies as well. I just kind of I'm just trying to build out more and more resources. And the Indie Film Hustle brand uh, really kind of just took a life of its own. And uh, you know I it still fascinates me because I mean look you guys understand I'm sitting here with a mic, you know, in a room here in LA. And I, I know people, I see numbers, I see numbers of people downloading and I hear comments and stuff, but generally speaking, you don't really know if you're reaching anybody. But when you go out to these film festivals, when you go out to the film markets and, and filmmakers really come up to you and explain to you how the work that you're doing has changed their life or saved them tens of thousands of dollars or made them avoid this huge monstrous mistake that would have destroyed them, that is addictive. Uh, and I really love doing that. I really lean in with being of service to my audience. And that is, I think, the best place any creator can be is to be of service to the audience and build systems out around it that you can make some money because if you can't make money, the system doesn't work. You got to, you've got to, you've got to be able to generate revenue, but do it in an ethical way and do it in a way that actually solves people's problems. And that's what I've been uh, doing with Indie Film Hustle and all my other brands, but it's kind of just taken a, a life of its own up and, uh, and I love it. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a gift that you're saving people a lot of time going down Hoping. wrong roads. Yeah. Just by providing helpful information. And um, I kind of, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of where else to go, but I think I, I want to talk to you about the, uh, your commencement speech. How was it like, you know, when did you get that invitation? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, how was it like, and was that like your first commencement speech that you gave? you know, as Alex Ferrari of Indie Film Hustle? No, I've done, I've done, I've, I've spoken at USC Film School and at, at, at New York Film Academy at, at multiple film festivals, but that was the second time I did a keynote about shooting for the mob. Um, the first time I did it was at the Chinese Theater in LA. Uh, at, at my, I think I, I did it at the world premiere of, uh, or I won, one of the premieres of uh, On the Corner of Eagle and Desire, my, my, my second film. Uh, but, uh, I, I just know uh, the, um, oh my God, I can't believe I can't, forget, I can't remember. Tony, thank you, Tony. Tony, uh, <laughs> Tony um, who runs the, the, um, the, the festival, uh, was a fan of mine and had been following me for a long time. And when he started his festival, he was like, hey, would you, would you fly up to San Fran and, and talk and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll play your movie? And I'm like, yeah, sure, absolutely. And it was one of the best film, film festival experiences I've ever had. But I, uh, I, I sat down and thought about how I was going to give that keynote because it's not just about the story of how I almost made a $20 million movie for the mob and how my life was threatened on a daily basis for over a year. And then how I was flown out to LA and I met the biggest movie stars in the world, billion dollar producers, head of CAA, all these kind of things when I'm 26, 27 years old. That's an insane story, but I wanted to use it as a tool to teach people what not to do when they're following their dreams because there's so many filmmakers and artists in general, filmmakers, actors, musicians, all of them, there's always somebody in the wings waiting to take advantage of you because of the love of what you do or what you want to do. That has been, that's as old as time. Mm -hmm. So I wanted this to be a cautionary tale about not to sell your soul for, I didn't even get, I didn't even sell my soul for the opportunity. I sold it for the mere chance of the opportunity, of the promise of the opportunity. That's how stupid I was. Um, but I went on this insane adventure. You know, I met insane people. And <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I mean, if you read the book, there's so many stories. Uh, I mean, that are, it's just, it's just insane. Insane. I, I look back, I'm like, I don't even know how I survived that. And people who read the book now tell me that like, Alex, I know you're alive, but I really am concerned about you while I'm reading the book. I'm not sure <laughs> if you're going to make it. I'm like, dude, I'm alive. I'm like, I know, but the book, the way you wrote it, and it's like, I don't know if you're going to make it. So um, yeah. I'm like, well, good. I guess I did my job right. Yeah. Um, but that book was probably the most difficult creative thing I'd ever had to do in my life because it, uh, it took me 17 years to have the courage to actually write the story. Wow. And then... Um, and then on top of that, I needed to kind of go back to the darkest time in your life because I can't, I, I mean, as, as, as a filmmaker or as a creative, if you're sitting a foot or two away from your dream, I'm literally talking to Batman. 
I'm literally talking to one of the actors who played Batman at the height of his power, where if he jumps on the movie, it's a go movie. We're, we're, we're rocking and rolling. Uh, and you're sitting there and, you're, and Batman's telling you, I want to be in your movie. I love what you've done. I, I love the work you've, you've shown me. Uh, your director's real, all that. I want to do your movie. Hey, do you want to sleep over? Like literally, I'm like, Batman wants me to sleep over his house. This is amazing. Um, <laughs> imagine being there and then a week later, you're gone. It's over. And that's, that's, and by the way, that's at the end of a long year long process of having your, your dreams dashed a thousand yeah. times from talking yeah. to Oscar winners to being in, you know, the end of true romance. Like if you remember the end of true romance, when you're in that big time producer's house in yeah, the screening the room. Yeah. I'm, I'm without the shooting. I was there. I was in <laughs> a billion dollar producer's house up in the Hills in his screening room, watching my movie, watching the, 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 the sizzle reel I made for this film and, and talking film with him. Like it was just so surreal. Um, so yeah, that's we'll, like what we'll you think. That's, that's the ideal image of like, if you, you're a filmmaker, that's essentially where you want to be. Right. And the yeah, fact that or, you were there. <laughs> or you could be at the Chateau Marmont taking, taking a meeting with like the head of CAA and one of the other biggest movie stars in the world. Or you could be right. at the Ivy meeting with some big tot Hollywood <laughs> uh, actor. Or like all of, the, all of those, all of those. Yeah. I, I, I was at Jerry's Famous Deli meeting with somebody else. Like it's all of those places where you're like, yeah, that would probably be in a movie. That's where you would go. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> spa goes yeah i was there like i mean it's it was it was insane it was insane but i again i wanted to use it as a uh a tool a teaching tool and that's really the re main reason i wrote it it wasn't just to 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 get it out of me because i needed to get out of me I, trust me i was crying i was literally bawling while i was writing certain, certain chapters because imagine going to the darkest time in your entire life and then living there for three or four months you know, yeah. I mean, I, I would skip, I would literally skip chapters because I knew where I had to go emotionally to write it. It was absolutely brutal. Like, absolutely Especially after brutal. blocking it out, you know, essentially mentally yeah. for so long and then yeah. you have to. Yeah, I have to go back in. And it's not like I sat there for, you know, 17 years going, <laughs> and I wasn't like, yeah. it was, but it was completely in the back of my mind and it completely changed the trajectory of my career. I was terrified to make a feature film because of that horrible experience. And my subconscious stopped me from ever, making a film until I broke through that. Um, and, I, and I owe Indie Film Hustle, uh, I, I owe the, the tribe um, the, the courage to do that because I did my first feature film um, and, and when I was about 41, uh, which is about 20 years, 20 some years after I started the journey of trying to make a feature film. But I could have made a feature film a decade earlier, comfortably, yeah. you know, but I, I, I stopped myself. But yeah, that's, that's, uh, that was that book. And I think, uh, again, the book is Shooting for the Mob. Uh, obviously, it was gonna, I was going to ask some – there it is right there. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask some follow-up questions, but you know what? You guys are better off just buying the book. Uh, 999 yeah. Kindle, 1795 on uh, paperback. Check it out. Mm -hmm. we'll, keep, we'll put a link in the description. And I also wanted to ask you um, or comment on the, uh, the keynote speech it, it really applies to any indie creative. Uh, you know, I, was hearing, I, was, I was hearing you go through what you're saying and, and a lot of the, the mental blocks that we, we're essentially, you know, a, a, actors are told you are your worst enemy. You need to basically, you know, you think you're an actor. Oh, I could just pretend to be someone. Nah, like all your blocks show up on screen. So it's like essentially mm -hmm. a therapy session that you have to do mm -hmm. with yourself. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. So, but it, I, I heard, um, I heard a lot of things in that speech that you gave that, you know, pretty much resonated with all the guests that we pretty much had, you know, uh, whether they're uh, musicians, filmmakers, you know, uh, writers, what have you. Um, and, you know, segueing into the uh, feature film, <laughs> the guerrilla style feature film that you made at Sundance. It's so funny I, when I, when I, Initially went in there, I assumed, you know, I didn't look too much into it. Is this a documentary about a bunch of filmmakers? You know what I mean? And then right. the first scene happens. I'm just like, what the heck is this? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is insane. And then I realized, you know, as, as I watched it, I seen what it's about. But the funny thing is that movie, um, if, if listeners haven't, you know, for some reason you, you haven't seen or have been introduced to any film hustle, a lot of lessons that uh, I listened to, you know, over the years, listening to, you know, some of the mm -hmm. videos, 
they're pertinent there. You know, mm-hmm. show up on time. Make sure your your you know project that you're writing is your own voice. Don't try to make it like you know Francis. Oh, do that like what Richard Bottos <laughs> feedback yeah, was. RB, at the yeah, end RBs is great. Yeah, was pretty much a huge lesson in and of itself. So I love that you made not only like a, a movie that's. Uh, you know, I felt like I was watching a '90s John Favreau movie. It was like Swingers for Indie. That, that's what I was going for. I was going <laughs> for. I mean, I mean, there's a little bit. I shot it with a, a the the Black Magic Pocket 10 uh, 1080p camera, not the 4K yeah. camera. So I wanted that Super 16 look. I threw Super Super 16 grain on it. So I wanted to have that that kind of nostalgic '90s. Yeah. You know, Clerks. You know, you know that kind of vibe uh, to it. And it was, it was very, it was very swingers esque, yeah. um, to say the least. But I wanted a, I hadn't seen a film like that before. There isn't really a film made like that. And no. who's insane enough to go to Sundance and shoot a movie? <laughs> I mean, without permission, <laughs> like that's insane. Yeah, that's ballsy. That's it's like a- ridiculous. <laughs> so how, um, you know, what, how was Sundance to, you know, explain to someone who may want to know how what what's the myth versus the reality um what's it like to be at that festival um you know quick five quick quick answer for that yeah i mean yeah sundance is 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 a magical magical place it was pre-covid i don't know what it's going to be like post-covid but pre-covid um it was a magical place it was kind of like uh disneyland for independent film because you walk around and you just see all these amazing actors and producers and everyone is jammed in a four or five block radius it is uh, it's there's nothing like it can isn't like it toronto isn't like it it is all connected and then it's because you're cold because it's freezing or snowing a lot of times, you're all huddled together. So there's interaction <laughs> that happens. So it is, it is a very magical place. I mean, I, I'll tell you, to be honest with you, most of the times I've gone to Sundance, I rarely get to see movies. One, because there's generally no ticket. But two, I'm just doing too much other things. There's too many other things to do at Sundance. So I, I've been to Sundance probably like six or seven times in my, in my life. And, uh, you know, it, it is an experience. It, it, at least it was. It was an experience. The reality is, as far as uh, being there is fun. But for a filmmaker to get a film in there, a lot of the myth of Sundance is that once you get in, uh, oh, it's, it's a golden ticket. It's not. It's not mm-hmm. 1995 anymore. Nobody's coming down from Mount Hollywood and writing you a half a million dollar check. Does that happen every year? Yes, it happens. But if you look at the films that it happens to, they all are very established very big stars uh, that are in the movie, like Little Miss Sunshine or Palm Springs last year. These are these are big stars that are doing indie movies. The clerks, the mariachis, the um, slackers of the world, mm. that, that's gone, man. Yeah. That is so gone. And even if you get accepted into Sundance, um, I know many films uh, that get accepted into Sundance, win Sundance, still don't get, don't get paid. Wow. Because the world is different. Our, our, the entire landscape of, in, of film and, and content in general is so radically different than the 1990s, which is where the, I always say that's basically the birth of the current independent film movement. You know, there was the 70s with, you know, a, a Easy Rider. And of course, there's Roger Corman and, and there's always been independent film. But the birth of what we know as independent film started in essentially 87 to 89 when, when C- the sex lies of videotape was sold yeah. at Sundance for a million bucks. Um, that's when it really began. Then, um, then there was uh, one film that honestly doesn't get a lot of attention. It should is Hollywood shuffle. If you guys don't yep. know the film Hollywood shuffle from 1987, he was the yep. first dude, Robert Townsend, because it's a comedy and you know, I don't know what other reason why he doesn't get the attention he deserves that film. He put on his credit cards. He was the first dude to do that and made, wow. and he made millions off that movie in a time period that could do it. So if anyone hasn't seen that movie, search it out because it's a funny commentary yeah, on Hollywood, you know, and being a black actor in Hollywood and all the stuff that he went through. It, it is a great, great, great movie. He, he should definitely get more credit than he deserves, than it deserves, that he's gotten. Yeah, I, he got a, I got a question for you. So when you say gorilla at Sundance, like exactly how gorilla were you? Like, were you, did you, <laughs> Did you walk into the restaurant and say, hey, can we shoot a scene here real quick? Or did you just walk in, sit down and shoot until they kicked you out? So I sat, I walked into the restaurant, sat down, started shooting. Oh, wow. And then they, then they started to come over and I'm like, hey, 
I'd like to order pizza for everybody. They're like, cool. Nice. And that was it. And then they're okay. like, do you want us to turn the music off? Yes. Nice. Uh, yeah. and, and that's the way, that's the way we rolled. We, we, I mean, some stores, some stores we like walked into and like asked for permission, like right. the bookstore right. and, and, uh, and other places like that. But other, like the head, the Sundance headquarters, that's completely wow. <laughs> just walked in, stole those shots. That's insane, stole them. man. And we had the balls to like, when we went to shot some stuff outside of the, the, the headquarters, which is in the back of that hotel, the, there was a radio on them. Like we had someone go and ask to turn them off because <laughs> <laughs> we were shooting and they're like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And they shot it off. So yeah, that movie is probably the ballsiest thing I've ever done. Um, I, I would do it again. It, it's so much fun doing that movie. It was so, so, so much fun. We shot that thing in four days. Uh, the oh. whole movie in four days. It, we, uh, we totaled around 36 hours of, of actual con of actual shooting of like pro of production. Cause I was still, I was, don't forget. I was, I was recording interviews for my podcast. So I was, yeah. I was making the movie on the side. It was a side hustle to movie. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, man. To get, get yeah, what you absolutely. Need. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's great. And, and now, um, Listen, we have uh, – obviously, COVID's coming around. Let's get a little topical here. What is the landscape you think uh, – you know, you're in Los Angeles, still on lockdown right now. Um, what's the landscape of, you know, indie filmmakers, you know, getting things off the ground? Because I know, uh, at least over here in New York City, you know, the TV's production's are already kind of starting up. But uh, as far as indie film, what's uh, – you know – What's the information you have that 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 that's on the on the come up over there? Is everything it, still it, on a standstill? As far as production is concerned, or as far as trying to get something sold or made? Uh, production. Production. Yeah, so there's some stuff going on there. I see. I, I I've had a, I have a couple of um, filmmakers who went through a COVID production that are coming onto the show soon. I recorded the interviews already. Awesome. People are shooting. People are shooting. Um, it's not like it was, and it's and it's definitely you know I don't see a lot of production running around LA. Um, yeah. but they are, but it is happening. It's just, it's just, it's just a different world, man. It's a right, different world. Right. But, and you know, we're independent filmmakers. I think at artists in general, it's like, this is, I love this commentary because this is basically the truth. You literally are seeing the world burn around you. The whole world's coming to an end. We have a pandemic, there's fire, fires, there's, <laughs> there's like earthquakes and hurricanes and the economy's crashing. Crashing, and the whole like I mean aliens are probably coming anytime now there's a meteor on its way all yeah. of this and filmmakers are going yeah that's all nice but how can I shoot my <laughs> next project <laughs> next week because I really think like it's but that's we're insane we're insane yeah. we're insane our artists are insane that way and it's not just us it's musicians all artists but you know our actors as well like how can i act right now like but filmmakers I, I i i hear it i hear it all the time i'm like don't you guys realize like there's such bigger fish in the world that needs to be fried right now yeah but that's us and on the flip side i i bet there has been content hasn't been consumed as much as it's been these last six months oh, yeah. you know in terms of movies <laughs> network streaming yeah but there's um, a myth but there's a myth there too a lot of a lot of independent filmmakers like oh man it's going to be like a, a you know so much money coming into us as independent no. filmmakers because there's so many much more content needed and there's a standstill no absolutely not you are absolutely wrong yeah. netflix ain't buying hulu ain't <laughs> buying amazon does not want your movie I just did a whole like 30 minute video about why <laughs> filmmakers don't make money. And literally right now, as we're speaking, Amazon is purging independent films who don't meet their criteria and are making it so difficult for independent filmmakers to upload their stuff on Amazon video direct. That's one barrier point. And then afterwards they're paying you a penny, yeah. a penny per hour. And if you make it to like 50% engagement or something like that, you're ramping up to four cents. Like to get the max 12 cents they offer, you got to be like at the 97th percentile, like at studio level interaction. So mm -hmm. there's so many myths out there in regards to um, this business and it's changing so rapidly. That's why I, I really take it upon myself to try to inform my audience and get the word out as much as possible about what the realities are because filmmakers are making films today thinking that when they're done with it, it's a year from when they started. So if I start making a film today, thinking about the marketplace as it sits today, you have failed. You won't make it because in a year when that movie is done, it will be a completely different landscape. Can you imagine those poor filmmakers who got into South by Southwest? 
Oh yeah, yeah, for, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. and then that got shut down. Like man. I know, I know one of them personally, man. They were they were gutted. Of course they were. Like you, you, you struggle all your life to get up to yeah. to Sundance, uh, to Sundance or South by or Toronto, one of these big festivals, and then hey, you got in. Oh, sorry, the world is shutting down. Yeah. Like what kind of crap is that? But that is the reality of what we're living in, and and I and filmmakers need to understand that. You know, if you were in the 80s and 90s, things were pretty stable for the most part, and it took a while for things to change. So VHS came, and then DVD market came, and then streaming started to slowly come. But now things are changing almost on a now because of the the pandemic, almost on a monthly level, monthly change. I mean, I just saw an article today or a few days ago. Disney is completely restructuring their business to focus on streaming. I saw that. Like. Yeah. If that's not a huge Indicator. alarm to yeah. everybody that the game has changed, I don't know what else is. But yet there's going to be filmmakers who are going to try to make their $500,000 movie with no stars attached, which is a drama off of a first-time filmmaker who could barely you know, yell action. And I see it all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. And then they wonder, well, why can't I make money? And then, then they sell it to a predatory film distributor for five cents. <laughs> and they'll never see another dime. It, it, it's that funny. It's the truth. It's the yeah. truth. I literally had that conversation yesterday with a filmmaker. It's, it's sad. Okay. And uh, before we uh, round out with your book, Alex, um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, how has giving back to uh, the community, so to speak, your, your indie film hustle brand, how has that, uh, you know, affected or uh, helped out your career as a filmmaker? Uh, man, I can't express what an impact this made in my career because uh, well, I forgot who said it, but they, I think it was, oh God, I forgot who said it, but it's like, if you want to make your dreams come true, help somebody else with theirs. Yeah. And that is a mantra I live by because I, because of all of the, the, all right, let's take it back. I've struggled for most of my career to get to where I want to be as most independent filmmakers have. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people look at me, look at my career and they're like, wow, you, you, you know, a lot of success, a lot of this or that. Yeah, but it's not, it's great. And I'm very grateful for all of it. But, you know, I always had troubles getting to every, every little milestone was just such a slog, such a brutal experience. And then the moment I started giving back to my um to an audience. And by the way, this exact same thing happened in 2005 when I released my DVD. See, I was giving back then, and that's when so many opportunities opened up for me. I was, I was called by Oscar-winning producers. I was called by big agencies. I was flown out to, to different uh, festivals um, by big producers who wanted to produce a feature version of that short film. All of those things happened because I started to give back. I didn't, I didn't connect that until I started Indie Film Hustle. Because because of Indie Film Hustle, I've been able to have communication and, and sit down and talk to some of the greatest minds and some of the most influential people in our business. I would never be able to sit down with the DP of Titanic and Avatar and talk to him for an hour and a half and pick his brain about how he shoots. You know, or how he got his first job make, uh, DPing Ghouls 2. Because uh, that's the first question I asked. I'm like, yeah, we're going to get to Titanic, brother. But how'd you get Ghouls 2? He's like, whoa, where are you coming from? I'm like, yeah, I want to know how you got that job. That's interesting to me. Hey, they never expect that one. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, or sitting down talking to some of the greatest screenwriters, uh, you know, of all time and, and, and figuring out how they construct the story. And then talking to producers, talking to financiers, talk, just making connections with people that, I would have never been able to make a connection with. And because I'm providing value to them and helping them with whatever, the, you know, by being on my show or by, you know, you know, giving them a, a, a stage for them to talk or give back, I'm able to build relationships with uh, a lot of my, my former guests. And then not only that, just because of the platform in general, people just start reaching out to me. You know, I got to, I got to interview Barry Sonnenfeld, you know, the, the wow. director, the director of men in black. And, and we sat down, we talked for two hours. I yeah. got to talk to Barry Sonnenfeld for two hours and talk to him like, how'd you meet, how'd you get involved with the Coen brothers? 
because he was the DP for Blood Simple. Um, was it Blood Simple, Raising Arizona, Miller's Crossing? That whole first four or five films yeah. was him. I'm like, how'd you do that? He's like, oh, I met I met this tall, lanky dude in a corner at a party, and I had a 16 millimeter camera, so I was hired. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know th- those kind of relationships, that kind of access is 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 remarkable. And they reached out to me; I didn't reach out to him. So that was that was what's so amazing to be able to do with with this business, with this uh, platform that I've created. It is it is impacting my career in ways I can't even express. Um, and I and and I I know it's impacting way it's impacting my career in ways that I have yet to see, mm-hmm. because when I want to go do a like perfect example on the corner of ego and desire, mm-hmm. without indie film hustle on the corner of ego and desire doesn't happen, because I connected with Adam my co-producer through someone I met through the through through the podcast. Then we, we hung out at Sundance. Then we're like, hey, let's go make a movie. Okay, great. So we'll make a movie next year. Great. So now we're going to do that. So now I'm helping him with his, his projects. He's helping me out with my projects. Then I call up RB, who I met on the podcast. I go, RB, I got a, a part for you. I want you to be in this movie. He's like, sure, I'll, just tell me where to go and I'll be there. I wouldn't have been able to do that beforehand. And all the other actors that I got, all the other actors who showed up for me without ever meeting me, and doing a crazy thing like, hey, we're going to go shoot a movie at Sundance, completely gorilla, um, and you've never met me before. They showed up. Why? Because of Indie Film Hustle, because of what I was able to show, show them. They're like, this guy's serious. Those are things that are intangible. And there's things like that right now. That I, 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 there's probably projects I'm going to be doing in the, na- the near future or in the distant future that will be directly, the Indie Film Hustle will be directly responsible for me being able to get those things done. And it's wonderful, but it wasn't my goal. And that's the difference where most people fail is that they're like, I'm going to open up a podcast because I'm going to be huge and I'm going to meet these big yeah. people and I'm going to yeah. start, I'm going to start pitching them my shit and I'm going to be doing this and that. And that's the wrong energy. Right. And professionals understand that. And when professionals feel that energy, it's that sucky Dracula energy that I just want to suck your energy out, energy suckers, they, uh, they get turned off. I go into every interview just like, dude, I just want to talk to you. Yeah. Let's just, let's just yeah. talk. So Barry, when you'd made your first pornos as a DP, <laughs> how did that work? <laughs> and he talked to me for 20 minutes and gave me the most graphic, graphic, and listen, I've been around, most graphic story of a porno set I have ever heard in my life. It made me blush. <laughs> so if anyone listening, you got to listen to that podcast. You got to listen to that show. Watch that video and listen to that podcast. Episode. It's, it's in the first 20 minutes. It's so he genius. really has, he really has made uh, shot pornos. Oh no, he shot. No, that was his first thing. That was his first oh, job. Wow. Okay. He bought a 16 millimeter package and in order for him to pay off a 60 millimeter package, he shot for a week. He shot 20 pornos in a week. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Holy shit. And he's like, Alex, I mean, by the end of it, by the end of it, man, I had 60% of my camera paid off, baby. I was ready saying, to go. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm just roll it. This is the seventies. It's a whole other yeah. you know, it was the late eighties or something like that. Early eighties. Late seventies, early eighties. So it was a different world. And he's like, yeah, I did what I did. And he goes, but I was really kind of revolutionary because I actually set up certain techniques that the, film, the porn industry uses today that where they weren't <laughs> using before. So, you know, and that's, that's, that's what this platform has given me. It's given me that access to pick up the phone and call people. And, and I'm not just another filmmaker trying to get a project off the ground or another filmmaker trying to do this. I've got, I, I'm trying to bring value to a relationship that I, I'm trying to build. And, and the, building a platform uh, does that in, in ways that I can't really express. But all I could tell you is if anybody listening out there wants to move their career forward, help other people. Yeah. yeah help yeah. other people get their stuff off the ground. And I promise you, you're going to take it, take an advantage of someone's going to screw you over. It's okay. Keep going. Keep doing it. Keep, don't keep getting abused. I'm going to say that. Um, <laughs> but but, you know, learn from your lessons. Keep moving forward. Always lead with being of service to other people. And I promise you, opportunities will open up in ways that you cannot see. I promise you. And it might not be now. I mean, the relationship I've built with RB, it's been a five-year friendship that we've built up. And it's been multiple times. So by the time I called RB up, and if people who don't know who RB is, he's the uh, founder 32. of Stage 32. 
you know, when I called up RB, we were about three years into our friendship. We had hung out. We have helped each other. He had been on my show multiple times. I helped him with his book. I, you know, helped, like, I just did so many things for him. And he, in, re, in return, helped me with things. So when I called him up, he just said, sure, where do you want me to go? Like, wh- wh- what time do you need me to be there? That was it. He didn't even know, like, he didn't even know the story. <laughs> He's just like, I'm making a movie about a bunch of filmmakers trying to sell their movie, and you're the guy that they're chasing. All right, cool. And then when he got there, he's like, Where, where's the script? I'm like, there's no script. What do you mean there's no script? No, no, we're using, we're using this thing called a scriptment. What the F is a scriptment? A script. Like, what is that? And I'm like, no, no, they should, it's, it's, if we just do this, this, and this. And then, and then I have him hanging out outside freezing his butt off in that scene <laughs> yeah. for like 30, 40 minutes while I'm like all nice and cozy. My actors are all freezing their asses. So <laughs> On the patio, yeah. <laughs> On the patio. They're like this. And I'm like, one more take. And they're like, Alex, we love you, man. But Jesus Christ, yeah, come right. on. Let's move it along. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a great testament to uh, always, because that, that, that's a way to establish a genuine relationship versus yes. you know, something yeah. else. And a yeah. lot of people, um, you know, even uh, we had uh, Bill Obers Jr. on the show and he was telling us the most established people, they're always, uh, for the most part, they're humble. There is no ego and they can see it a mile away. Uh, oh. So, yeah, it, oh. there is. Yeah. And the beauty is that your movie um, uh, was essentially that lesson. I mean, you see the actor coming off, going into the elevator. What is indie film hustle anyway? Like, you didn't think to look that up beforehand. Like, you know, you go into a meeting prepared. It's all these lessons that are baked. <laughs> and by in- the way, and by the way, I was really, really self-conscious about promoting indie film hustle in the, in the movie. I did not want to do it heavily. I didn't want him to. I didn't want to have a scene where the dude sits there and like explains to him hey okay yeah. film hustle has this podcast and i didn't want that so i forgot i think it was one of the actors who came up there, like why don't we just ask the question and that, then at the end of it we pops up like oh, okay that's cool that i thought was so brilliantly yeah. done i was like oh mm-hmm. thank god we don't have to sit there and talk and i didn't want to ha- i didn't want to cast myself i but i didn't ha- i wanted actually to have somebody else but that guy never showed up so i'm like well i guess i'm gonna be the good and yeah it's product placement, but yeah. I was very cautious. I was very cautious about making it not like a big commercial for indie film hustle. <laughs> yeah, it, it it added to the atmosphere because it felt, you know, it just felt real. And uh, <laughs> I thought it was fine. I thought it was brilliant. You know, it was a perfect you, encapsulation man. of uh, you know what your podcast is about in that movie, in a sense. Uh, I appreciate that, know, man. You know, I haven't uh, seen it. Yet. It's on my watch list, though. I have yet to check it out. Yeah, How dare and- you, sir? How dare you, sir? <laughs> Come prepared to an interview. Did you not just hear <laughs> what Michael said? Come prepared. Oh, <laughs> hey, hey, if if I can if I can uh, justify myself real quick, I have watched <laughs> hours of your videos. So fair enough, fair enough. I've got, I've got a little bit in there. I've got a little. He's bit the in persecuted there. millennial. Right? But hey, just hey, like now, the I'm, in the movie. <laughs> now I'm looking. <laughs> I, hey, I'm looking forward to it now. I'm looking forward to watching it. <laughs> what does she call? What does she call herself? Something the oppressed millennial. millennial. I forget. Like, a, like it's like an oppressed millennial <laughs> <Yes>. or <laughs> disenfranchised. <laughs> Disenfranchised millennial. Oh, I wanted to <laughs> punch her in the face. Which I actually, when I said cut, I'm like, Sonia, I want to punch you in the face after you said that. It is such a brilliant line. She came up with that. The stuff that came out of her mouth was amazing. Yeah. I mean, oh. She was fantastic. Oh. I know that. I think everyone knows that person. And she <laughs> nailed I mean, she freaking nailed it. I oh, mean. so oh, all of them. The actor, <laughs> the producer, the yeah. director, all the stereotypes are in there. And, they, and how they interact with each other. I was... I, it's so it's one it's easily the the most fun I've ever had shooting anything in my life, and it's the thing I'm the most proud of. It has a lot of heart in it. I, I hope that yeah. comes through. Absolutely, absolutely, it does. Are you, are you uh, ever thinking about doing something else like that? Uh, man, like, well, I don't know, man. I don't know if I'm gonna like my next my next film. I, I'm thinking I want to try to do something a little bigger. It's either mm-hmm. gonna be a documentary or it's gonna be. Uh, it's gonna be a bigger project because I've already done yeah. two very yeah. micro budget films, so I've kind of done that yeah. i could literally do an ego and desire every month i, I could i could i mean i yeah, could make it yeah. i make i could make a year yeah. out of it and just produce 12 movies yeah. about things i want to do and shoot it around la this pre-covid obviously um right. and shoot it around la i could do something like that it's not what i want to do it, it, it's mm-hmm. I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to tell that story and that way of telling that. That's the only way you can make that movie. Like you right. can't make them. You can't make that movie with half a million dollars. Like you just can't. Yeah. Because I would never have gotten permission. I would have never been able to do anything of the things I did. Um. The way we shot it and everything. So, but I think in future, I think the next project will probably be 
the next a, a little bit level up, you know, as far as budget is concerned, scope is concerned, and then start growing from there. But I think I'll always, I mean, I'm not against coming back and shooting like this run and gun, Chris, Christopher Guest style, you know, um, improv movie. There's something about shooting an improv film the energy is so electric in the air. Like anything can happen. Anything does happen. And I love walking that tightrope. Like it's so exciting for me to do that. But that's for, not for every story. Like, you yeah. know, you can't shoot Terminator yeah. like that. Like yeah. the Terminator, is, it's not a movie you can shoot like that. You know, you need, there's certain stories you can do that with. And this was a perfect uh, vehicle for that. And my first film, This Is Meg, was a, per a perfect vehicle for that as well. and made sense to do uh, in that style. But, yeah. Um, moving forward, I think I'll I'll probably do something. But I am I am looking into some documentaries that uh, that might shake some heads. Yeah, it is chilling because you know I've done a few shorts and nothing on the level that you've done, obviously. But where we just gorilla gorilla the whole thing, and even that, you know, based on on that low lowest level, it was even that was just like, dude, this is this is crazy, man. Holy shit, I can't believe we're doing this. So it's so fun. But but yeah. the thing is that you're creating. Yeah. And that's where, the, well, that's what all filmmakers, actors, you know, artists in general, you've got to create, you got to keep creating. And I don't care if it's good, bad, or indifferent, just create because something good comes out of it. You'll meet somebody, yeah. you know, actors always complain like, oh, I've gone 30 auditions. Yeah, that's great. Today, you did 30 auditions today or this week. Great. You should be doing theater. You should be doing shorts. You should be offering your services for free out there to get your name out there to get yeah, noticed yeah. to build up just act just direct just mm -hmm. write just keep creating you know the reason why indie film hustle has been able to be built into you know whatever it is today is because i am a just i'm relentless i don't slow down uh i'm literally i think at six podcasts now i wow. think i'm at six different podcasts that i produce i think five of them i'm in um and <laughs> And I and there's probably a new one coming in the new year, you know. So it's just nonstop. People and are Ryan like, how the hell? Stops, man. No, it's the hustle doesn't stop. It the hustle. It just excuse me. The Let's hustle the, the hustle doesn't stop because it's it's what I love doing. Right. I, I absolutely love doing it, and I don't get tired of doing it. I I, I don't. I, I and I'm just, like I'm writing a new book, which I won't talk about right now. But uh, it, I'm super excited about everything that that entails because you know me, I can't just write a book. I got to write it. I got to build a website. I got to build right, a podcast. Right, right, right. <laughs> like, right. I can't just write a book. Yeah. I got to build an entire world around it. So I'm so excited about doing that, you know, and I got new courses and new other things that I'm building out um, that are exciting as well. So uh, it's just, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. And I hope that comes through with all my work. Now, as far as the beta, uh, I know you had a beta course online. Is there going to be a, a, a official launch date or is that still kind of yeah. in the works? Uh, so, yeah, I, I finished doing the, um, the complete film distribution blueprint, which is a six hour, I count it, six hour course on film distribution. It is the ultimate fantastic. course on how not to get screwed by a distributor and everything that comes along with that. So I, I talks about every way you can generate revenue through the traditional way of, of making movies. Not the film entrepreneur way, which we'll talk about in a minute, mm -hmm. but the traditional ways, meaning working with a distributor. And we also, excuse me, we also talk about um, distribution, uh, not distribution, but deliverables, all the technical aspects of audio deliverables, uh, video deliverables, paper deliverables, you know, E&O insurance, all of that kind of stuff. You know, how to sell to an airline, how to sell to a cruise line, all of those things. And then there's a huge section on all the tricks that distributors use in their contracts to screw you over and how to avoid all these different pitfalls that they will lay out. And uh, it's going to be, I just closed it up at the end of last month. Uh, we're going to be launching it again, probably mid-November. Is when oh, okay. I'm launching it. Uh, we're going to do a full blown launch for it now, uh, and it's uh, and it also has about twelve hours of interviews. So I, oh, I, awesome. I incorporated a, a ton of interviews with professionals of people who've been on the show, and actually there's a few in there that haven't even been released yet. So uh, the, I had just had a two hour interview with a, a great distributor friend of mine who just broke down the world that we live in today, which is scary. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so that's going to be coming out, and I and I and that's on uh, at uh, IFH Academy, Indie Film, Indie Film Hustle Academy, uh, dot com, and uh, and yeah, and just trying to provide more and more service to uh, to my audience. So drive us, uh, 
give us a little bit of uh, what was the impetus between you know behind writing Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, um, and what is you know what was the drive behind it, and what can people, I guess, expect to learn from it? So you're talking about this book right here, sir. There it yes, is, sir. I apologize for my face being on the cover, um, but. Uh, <laughs> I had to. I had to put something on there. I was like, "Well, all right." I, put I look really. I mean, if you look at, I look really pissed off. Yeah, you look, seri- um, you look serious. I'm, I, it's, it's like I'm deadly serious because it's about money. So we are going to talk serious. Oh, I um, like it. You look like you're like, listen to me, motherfucker. Listen, <laughs> motherfucker. You want to make some money? Yeah. Look at the eyebrow. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so, um, so what I did with Rise of the Entrepreneurs, I. I I started seeing patterns in how how filmmakers were making money outside of the traditional model, meaning outside of going to a film distributor and just using the exploitation of that film to make money. Because that's the traditional that's the traditional definition of film distribution or making money with films is like if you're a film studio, you make a movie, you put it out in the theater, you put it out online, and you the money you make from the rentals and sales and and uh, you know sales overseas and things like that. That's what you make. That's the money you make off of that. That's the traditional model. And independent filmmakers have done that uh, since the beginning of time. So I started seeing patterns of filmmakers who were not doing that. They were doing, they were building businesses around their films. They were creating ancillary product lines and services outside of their films that were making more money than the films themselves. And I interviewed a ton of them uh, over the years, as well as I've just, I'm a student of the industry, so I, I'm always constantly watching and seeing what's happening, right. who's doing what. Uh, and now I'm really tapped, like, because of Indie Film Hustle, like I'm really tapped in and a lot of these filmmakers reach out to me to tell me their stories. So I started seeing all of these different, um, these different uh, options out there and examples of ways of making money. So I, I had learned a lot about building an online business, building indie film hustle. So I have, uh, have my experience and expertise about how to build a business around a niche audience and things like that. So I combined the two. I combined my filmmaking passion with my business passion. And together came the film entrepreneur, which is the entrepreneurial filmmaker. I feel that the future of independent film has to be the entrepreneurial filmmaker. The film entrepreneur. There is no other option, in my opinion, five years from now, that filmmakers are going to be able to make a substantial living off of the exploitation of their films. If you want to see where we're going, or where honestly where we are now, but I there, think yeah. where we're going to be even worse off, just look at the music industry. If you look at the music industry, this is the exact same thing that happened in the music industry. A song used to cost $18 because you had to buy the damn album. Mm -hmm. Then they started releasing singles. But then after MP3 showed up and Napster showed up, the whole game changed. And now all of a sudden, it went from 99 cents a song to a fraction of a cent for a play on a streaming platform. When Beyonce is not making a lot of money, what chances do the rest of us have as as, as musicians? Mm -hmm. So that is where we're going. I mean, Amazon paying a penny, per an hour stream is the equivalent of, it's basically an insult. It's crazy. Of your content. It's yeah. an insult. So filmmakers are still building, their business model is, is built upon concepts from the 90s and the early 2000s, where you can make any movie, an action movie, you throw Tom Berenger in it, you throw it up on DVD and you got Sniper 7. And that movie is going to make 7 million bucks on DVD because that was the cash cow for about a decade, DVD was a cash cow around the world. But now when the DVD market pretty much dried up and now that streaming has taken over, the value of content has dropped and dropped across because of the devaluation of content. So as filmmakers move forward in their careers, if they don't start thinking about building businesses around their, 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 their films or start dropping their price, their, their budgets down to ego and desire, I hate to say it, $3,000. That's, that's <laughs> generally not a, a budget that you should be working at. But $50,000, $100,000 and below and, and stacking the chips in your favor to actually get, um, to get seen, to get out there, understanding how the business runs. If you don't understand any of that, just the traditional ways, you're dead. But if you don't start learning how to build businesses around your movie and create content that you could build a business and or a career around, you're going to have a really tough time. Not everybody. 
I'm going to say there's some people who are going to be able to make, you know, there's going to be those outliers always. But for the rest of, you know, I'm talking to the 19,000 rejections from Sundance. I'm not talking about the 180 that got in. And even the 180 aren't making all the money either, by the way. So I'm talking to everybody else. So if you don't start thinking about your film uh, as a business, you won't make it. You just won't. And you're a hobbyist at that point. You're not a professional filmmaker. So the film entrepreneur model really breaks down how you start creating product or a film for a specific niche audience because the niche audience is the most powerful thing an independent filmmaker has. If, and I use in the book, uh, The Vegan Chef, The Vegan Chef uh, movie. If you're going to make a romantic comedy that's a general romantic comedy with no stars attached, you're going to die. It's not going to get sold. You're not going to make any money on it. And nobody's going to see it because I, what are you going to do? You're going to watch a, a romantic comedy by a studio or by Hallmark at least that has maybe Dean Cain in it? Yeah. Or are you going to watch a romantic comedy by an independent filmmaker who, you know, eh, maybe, maybe it's amazing. Maybe it's not, but I'm not going to take that chance. I'm going to take a chance on something I know. Mm -hmm. Or you make a vegan uh, romantic comedy about a vegan chef who meets a, a barbecue pit champion and they fall in love and all hell breaks loose because they're like Romeo and Juliet. You can't mix the two. And, right. blah, blah, blah. Um, and now you market that audience, you market that film to the vegan community, to the paleo community, to the vegetarian community, to the plant-based food people. And you start foot filling that hole because there isn't a lot of content that's aimed at vegans narrative by the way and now all of a sudden you start building out this you could start building out a business around it where you could start creating online courses about uh cooking uh sponsors, vegan dishes yeah. and sponsors all these other things that you could start building out a real business and then you know i'm not sure if you want to make vegan movies for the rest of your life maybe you do but you can build that business up enough where it's starting to generate enough revenue that you can go off and make your horror movie if you want and yeah. don't care if it makes money because you want to express yourself as an artist it's about creating a business to do what you can. Like I've been able to build out a business for myself that allows me to, to go off and make ego and desire and not care a thing about if it makes money or not. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, it wasn't a tremendous amount of money to start with, $3,000, you know, but it's, I'm not, I'm not going to die if it doesn't make its money back. By the way, I've already made my money back on it, and it was mostly outside of the traditional way. <laughs> because I, you know, I, I, I used it constantly in throughout all of my, my um, outlets through my podcast, through my, uh, my YouTube channel, through my book, through all these other places that I use that content to generate revenue for myself. It's just a different way of looking at filmmaking. And it, I'll tell you, I've hit resistance from filmmakers. Um, I've, I've had, I've had heated conversations with other podcasters who are so stuck in their way of thinking that it, it kind of feels like, well, wait a minute, that's not my belief. And it really scares them because I don't want to open, I don't want to build an online course about cooking. I just want to make movies. I'm like, dude, I just want to go and play the, the uh, Madison square garden with John Juan Jovi. It ain't going to happen. Bro. Just because I want something doesn't mean it's going to happen. Right. So I want, I want to go make the next Marvel film. You know, I'll, I'll do Dr. Strange three. I don't care. Like I, I'm, 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 I want things as well, but if you don't build a system to get there, I don't care what you want. The realities are the realities, right? So you can play the game of trying to make a film to get noticed by a studio to give you a job where there, by the way, there is a dilute, just a complete uh, overstock of people wanting to be in that space. There's so much competition for that job, much more than when I started. I started in 96, you know, 95, 96 is when I started uh, my, my filmmaking career. And it was tough then. Now everybody and their mother's a filmmaker oh, yeah. and everybody wants those sweet studio jobs that, you know, when, when you get, when you're at the DGA and you get, you know, residuals and you get all that stuff, that's all great. But all, it's all built on the model, an old, crumbling model that doesn't make sense anymore you do you know that residuals are pretty much going away for television yeah i mean i was looking at th there was a you know conflicts with the with the screen actors guild yeah, contracts they, and all that they don't, so, yeah they have no power anymore yeah they have no power anymore I, I, unfortunately you know the days of like friends and seinfeld where these guys are pulling in 20 mil a year off of residuals off of those days are gone 
yeah. that will never happen yeah. again because the, the studios won't allow it anymore because Netflix changed the game. Yeah. So so all of that sweet sweet money that was happening back in the eighties, nineties, to early two thousands, um, and even to a certain extent early two thousand tens, is gone, and will not come back. So again, people are still thinking about this like it's 1995 it's not the world has changed dramatically and if you don't change with it you will get rolled over and that's what i'm just preaching from the top of the hill about to just trying to shake everybody up going dude the, the, the sky is falling rome is burning shit's going down and i want to give you the tools to help you make it to the next stage because honestly if i was a filmmaker coming into the business today literally just got out of film school last month and I have a $60,000 or $80,000 student loan on, which is another half conversation of how, how, how any film school does that legally is beyond me. Um, but it is a terrifying prospect because one, you have more access than you ever had in your entire life to making and creating content and building a business. There's tools in place, there's systems in place that if you are entrepreneurial, you can make it happen. Now, the bad news is the same thing for everything else, meaning that everybody else has the exact same, same access that you do. So unfortunately, for better or worse, you're going to have so much competition uh, getting in that you're going to have to be that much better. I was talking to, I was talking to a, a producer the other day, a, a seasoned producer on the show, and I was saying, hey, you remember like in the 80s, like all you needed to do was just finish a movie. That, that, that was it. Like Toxic Avenger got released. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, like had that, some great kills. Hey, yeah, that's some great yeah. kills. Hey, love Lloyd. Love Lloyd. <laughs> friend of the show. I love Lloyd. But, but, you know, movies just needed to be finished. I worked in a video right. store in the 80s. So I know what came out. Like it was, it was like sorority <laughs> babes in the Slimerama Bolarama. Really? <laughs> like it didn't, like if you just finished a movie, it got, it made money. Those days are gone. So you could be really bad at your job. And if you just knew the skills just to get that damn, damn thing over the finish line, it was made. You made money with it. In today's world, you have to be so much better, so much more educated, so much more diverse in the tools and the skill sets that you have just, just to bear out an existence, just to make a living in the business. It's a brutal commentary and I don't mean to scare anybody with it, but if, if you... It, it's an amazing time as well because you have all this access, but you're going to have to do much more work, much more work than I did when I first started out in 1996. In 96, I was making 50 bucks an hour as an editor, editing commercials and editing promos for like MTV and Nickelodeon in Florida. Do you know to get 50 bucks an hour today for an editor, you're rolling in it. <laughs> you're rolling in it and i that's such a horrible commentary yeah that the the, the the number the 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 hourly rage has gone down so you see how much more you need to do so you can't just be an editor you have to be a colorist you also have to be a post supervisor you have to be an online editor you you have to do graphics you might even have to do visual effects just to get back up to that 50 dollars an hour rage mm -hmm. do you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. yeah that's that's that that's unfortunate that is the reality of where we live in. And it's only going to get worse as we move forward. I'm, yeah. trying, to, I'm trying to finish with, a, with, a, with an upbeat, you know, upbeat, but I'm known for being pretty raw, and, but I don't want everybody who's like, well, the hell, I don't even want to be in this business. It's just going to be work. And a lot of people don't want to hear that. They want to go, I just want to make a movie, go to Sundance, get a check, and then just go over to Kevin Fahey's office and they just give me the next Marvel movie. Yes. Isn't that the way yes. it works? That's what most people want, but that is not the reality. And if you right. want to play in that, in that imaginary story, play with it. But I promise you, if you want to live in there, you're going to get burnt. You're going to get burnt. And even that it's, in and of itself is very difficult to do yeah. anyway. So yeah. It's uh, impossible. Yeah. One, we're talking about one <laughs> out of a decade that happens to. Yep. You know, who was the guy who did uh, Black Panther? Um, oh, Coolidge, Ryan Coolidge. Uh, you know, he, he did Black Panther. He oh, started Cooper, with an yeah. independent... Yeah, Ryan Coolidge. He did... Um, uh, was it the, the uh, Fruitvale, Fruitvale, Fruitvale Station? Fruitvale Station. Station. Yeah. yeah. Then he did Creed 2. So Fruitvale Station was basically his indie movie, mm -hmm. which is a fairly big indie movie, and it got yeah. a lot of attention, right? 
Then he got Creed 2, not because they gave it to him, because he wrote a Creed, because he wrote the story and convinced Stallone to do it and re- reinvigorate the Rocky fran- franchise, right? So yep. then he hustled, hustled to get that going. Then after that success, they offered him Black Panther and the rest, as they say, is history. It takes time and it takes yeah. hustle. You can say and the same was, with uh, James Gunn. You know, his indie was, uh, what was it, that Jesus. Slither movie? That Slither? Sl- yeah, man. And he was doing, I mean, he, I just saw an interview with him today, actually. He, made, he got paid $150 to write uh, Romeo, uh, Thromeo, Tromeo and Juliet for, for wow. Lloyd at Troma. Wow. He got paid 150 bucks. That's it, to write that script. And he wrote a bunch of stuff with Troma. That's where he got to start. Yeah, James Gunn yeah. started starting Troma. So he got paid 150 bucks, and, and Lloyd was pissed off that he had to pay him that much. <laughs> Uh, he said that he said that and then he was like really pissed off that he was like one of the highest paid people in trauma which means like he was getting paid like 125 bucks a week or something like that right Um, right. but you know for where james gunn is now to where he started dude that took decades decades of work and Mm -hmm. struggle and ups and downs come on man that's the reality of this business and he's a success story he's a success and for every one james gunn there's a million nobodies that we've never heard of and never will hear of because right. it's just that difficult right. to get in. But it's up to you, man. The power is in your hands. And if you want to go out and get something done, you just got to go out there and do it. You know, if you, if you want to start a podcast, go start off a podcast. It's not going to be easy. I talk to podcasters all the time. Mm-hmm. Either I'm guests on their shows or they, they come on my show. And they, you know, I see all these. I don't know about you guys. Have you noticed the, the, the barrage of filmmaking podcasts that have come out since the quarantine happened? Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, like all, there's like a thousand like, filmmaking <laughs> podcasts and screenwriting podcasts. Everybody now has a podcast, right? <laughs> and then I've been sitting here, you know, you know, with 400 plus episodes. Like they think that it just like happened overnight. I just, mm-hmm. I just keep pounding it, dude. I was, I was pounding two episodes a week for three <laughs> and a half years. Three and a half years, I was doing two episodes a week of that podcast. And now I do seven podcasts because I'm stupid. But, um, <laughs> but you got, it's just the work. Show up every day and keep pounding and pounding. It. And right. if you love what you're doing, man, you'll get to where you got to be. But just be wide open, eyes wide open about what you're getting into. Yeah, and you got to love what you're doing. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to hustle That's right. like you're doing yourself. And again, yeah. uh, the landscape's not going to change. It's all about your adaptability. And if you're able to read the tea leaves, fortunately for Alex, He's done the work for you guys. Uh, and so check out the book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. You can see it or read it on uh, Amazon. Uh, there's audio books as well. And we'll put a link to it in the description as well on his website, which has everything really you need. And by, and, yeah. and by yeah. the way, if you want it free, you could just go to free film book, uh, uh, was it filmbizbook.com and you can get an audio book of either Shooting for the Mob or uh, Film Entrepreneur for free. Just sign up for a, a trial at Audible and you get it for free. So if you want to do that. Right, now now you have no excuse, people. No, no excuse. <laughs> no excuse. <laughs> well, um, Alex, very much appreciative of your time. Thank you yes. so much for coming yeah. on uh, the Indie Rundown podcast. Uh, and, you know, we're going to we're gonna have so much fun sharing all your content. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. See I know this fun. went a little longer than usual, so I appreciate that. <laughs> no, no, that hey, was good. It's good. I, I always say that to people. It's like 30 minutes is – pretty much my cutoff time then you know hey if you're if you're willing to give us more information i ain't gonna stop you (laughs) (laughs) but uh um just want to thank you again for coming on and we look forward to reading your books and you know we're looking forward to seeing what else you got going on uh, on your journey as a filmmaker as well but uh, i I really Appreciate do appreciate the lesson that you kind of gave off is never show up to a party empty-handed always be willing to give always you know it's it's like business. You you want to you know there's there's it's not transactional, but you know be mm-hmm. genuine. And these people, you know these producers, filmmakers, what they're human beings first first and foremost. So mm-hmm. uh, treat most them as of such. Them. Most yeah, of them. Most <laughs> of them. <laughs> I've I've been around about I've been around a bit. Yeah, most of them are human beings. Right. Most of them. <laughs> um, I'm trying to be positive over here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you so much for that as well. And uh, yep. Yeah, I mean, if there's anything else uh, you want to add, otherwise, no, we're good. We're good, brother. I appreciate it. I'm sure you put all my links in the in the show notes. So thanks oh, yeah. again for we're, having me, man. And thank you for the and thank you for the good work you guys are doing uh, at the uh, at the podcast, man. So thank you so much. Thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. Alex Ferrari, everybody. Be sure to follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at The Indie Rundown and like our Facebook page, The Indie Rundown Podcast. 